Okay. Yeah, same species uh, living in the same general area. You define that area, so it depends on you know who the ecologist is um, and, and kind of what they want to study. Within population, um, they'll, they'll measure something called the density, which is sort of uh, similar to what you would see like with your density formula. You know, where it's the number of individuals, like in a science class, uh, number of individuals in a given area. So cities are very dense. There's a lot of people within a smaller area. Roars are the opposite. They're not dense because there's not as many people in that area. And then um, when you're studying population, you can look at the dispersion. So that's the pattern of spacing between individuals. There's three kinds of dispersion that I'll show you um, here in a couple slides. But how they, how they can like measure population, the most complicated way, but I guess technically most accurate, is you literally count every individual. But logistically, that's pretty difficult to do. So uh, what's more common is just random sampling. So it's kind of like what you get in, it's the idea of like surveying, right? So you would, you know, okay, it take a lot to count all of these. So maybe you just, let's just count the number of wildebeest, whatever these are, in this area. And then, you know, let's say there's 100 here. And let's say there's, this is one, ninth of the whole area, you would then multiply that by nine and that would give you the whole area of wildebeest. It's not gonna be completely accurate, but it's gonna give you the general idea. Um, also kind of the same idea behind maybe like a census data and stuff. Just kind of trying to get just um, uh, an idea of the bigger overall picture. Then there's another interesting thing called mark and recapture. So um, you can essentially mark one of these um, wildebeest or whatever it is that you're trying to count and then recapture it later and um, based on the number that you recapture versus like, you know, how much time you have to do the recapturing and all that, that could be sort of calibrated to figure out the population size or to track a population over time. Okay, so uh, a few things on dispersion. There's three kinds uh, that you'll see in nature. The most common is clumped. So clumped is what exactly what it sounds like. You get clusters of, uh, of organisms that are gonna cluster around each other. And they, the reason why they do that is because they're clustering around a, a resource they would need to survive. Anybody, anybody know what would be like the most, especially for like humans, what would be the most common resource we would clump around? If you look at like ancient civilizations and stuff. Yeah, to be. Like rivers and water. Yeah, like rivers, like a source of water and stuff, right? Um, then there's also uniform. So when you think of uniform, just think of like the metro, right? It can be weird if like, Somebody just like sits in the same metro seat as you and there's like a completely good open seat. So the idea of uniform is antagonistic interactions. Like I don't want to be around you, right? So go over there. Or, you know, if you're thinking more specifically with ecosystems, there's a competition for those resources, for that niche within that ecosystem, for that role. And so it's easier to be like spaced out than trying to compete for the same thing. Um, and then there's random, which is uh, uh, not, it's like the least common um, pattern in nature. Uh, you can kind of see with like this example showing wildflowers where, you know, depending on how like the wind just sort of will randomly spread out some of the seeds, that's going to lead to a more or less random pattern in the, uh, uh, in the soil there, or in the, the field there. Okay. Um, so if uh, you're studying demography, that's where you're going to be using um, certain statistics. Um, and trying to figure out how do those statistics affect a population size. So whether statistics that make a population grow or get smaller. Um, now, uh, kind of common sense, but it's worth pointing out that what makes a population grow are births, and what makes a population shrink are deaths. Um, and a way we can study uh, within a population, like different age ranges, is using something called a life table. So uh, here, this is looking at a population of ground squirrels and just seeing, um, okay, a bunch of different measures here. One of them that's kind of interesting is like the death rate, where when, when the squirrels are between nine to 10, the death rate is the highest. So that would give you an indication that, oh, okay, between that age range, squirrels, at least based on these ages, the squirrels can be the most likely to die there. Um, so anyways, there could be a live table for any really species and it could have a bunch of different kinds of measures, a statistical measure on it. Um, survivorship curves. So make sure you know the three types of survivorship curves and be able to identify their graphs. So type one survivorship curve is what we have. That's where there's a low death rate early on in life, 
And then as you get older, there's a steep drop off where, uh, you know, humans, it's around like 70s or 80s, that's when you get a big steep drop off in um, the number of survivors. Okay? Um, meaning, uh, you know, a lot of humans are going to be able to survive to like, you know, 90 something percent of their lifespan. Compare that to like, you know, type three, the oysters, they have a really high death rate where they, uh, they tend to die um, very early on in life. Very few oysters make it to their maximum possible lifespan. So on the x-axis, it's maximum possible lifespan. Not saying that oysters and squirrels live to be the same age, it's just looking at like the maximum age it could possibly live for that respective species. And squirrels, it's, um, it's kind of just a linear line, you know? So, there you go. Uh, all right, so, uh, some formulas you need to know for population ecology. Now, this seems super complicated. It's really not. And they're on your formula sheet. You don't need to memorize them. It's just uh, what I said earlier. Population size determined by the number of births minus the number of deaths. And that would then give you the change in the population. So if you had 20 births and then 20 deaths, the, pop the change in the population is zero. Okay? Um, so you get a positive number. It's a growing population. Negative, that's a shrinking population. Okay, uh, so a little bit more on zero population growth. Uh, yeah, again, they're equal, births and deaths, that's zero population. This is what a, uh, this is called like a, um, like an age structure within a, like a, like a certain country. In this case, Italy. At least according to 2011, uh, Italy has a zero, has a no growth population. So what that looks like is, um, and I'll show you like three other examples of, of like, low growth, high growth populations. But usually the, like, the thing that gives it away is the number of, um, of uh, uh, younger people in the population. So Italy, you can see how small their younger population is uh, compared to the, the rest of the population. All right, there's two population growth models you need to be able to know, um, especially being able to, to identify the graphs, know which graph goes to which one. Um, so exponential growth, especially from math class, that should be pretty simple for you. That's just where the faster you, the faster, the, the, the more you grow, the faster you grow is exponential growth. Logistic growth is interesting because it looks initially like it's exponential, but then um, the lack of resources that you run into will cause what's called a carrying capacity. So the population can't um, keep growing um, uh, infinitely faster. Uh, so looking at exponential growth, uh, elephant populations can grow um, exponentially or have grown exponentially now you know if you were to extend this graph onwards you would eventually get a leveling off but at least for a period of time they can show some exponential growth bacteria when i was growing like the bacteria that we used um uh, when we we're doing the bacterial transformation lab uh i grew them for 48 hours and i checked the bacteria after i think it was about 32 hours and i could see no growth and i was like oh my gosh i don't know if we have any bacteria but we did and why would that why would that make sense based on exponential growth i saw no growth and all of a sudden i come in the next morning boom all this growth there how would that why would that make sense based on this graph exactly right so it grows slow at first and then at some point it gets, especially right here, then it, it, it jumps up immediately. Have you ever done that, um, gosh, what's the question? It's like, would you rather have like a million dollars or, you know, I double your penny every day or something, you know? You know what I'm talking about? And it's like, you're like, oh, I'd rather, but then if you actually do the math, like it starts off low amounts of money, but you keep doubling something, it gets pretty big pretty fast. And that's what you see with the bacterial growth. Um, so here's the formula for exponential growth. It's, uh, this is another one that's on your formula sheet. <clears throat> and they define the variables for you in the formula sheet. So that's really nice. If they were to have you do some calculations with it, it's, it's really just a plug and chug problem. So here, a certain population of mice is growing exponentially. Growth rate R is 1.3. And then capital in your uh, current population side is 2,500. So how many mice are added after the first generation? Well, you would do 1.3, your R, times 2,500, your N. And that would give you your answer. So, um, now, what is, what you, exponential growth is 
very, 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 very rare in a population. What, how most populations will look is, is using the logistic model, where the logistic model has that carrying capacity, which they call K. So make sure you know that, K carrying capacity. It's kind of like if you're not very good at spelling, you might spell carrying capacity with two Ks, you know? Um, and uh, the idea of a carrying capacity, it, it kind of follows some common sense, right? Like things will keep growing and growing and growing, but eventually, again, you run out of resources, so there's gonna be a cap on that population. Now, the carrying capacity, that is specific for a species and for, for a different um, uh, environment, right? So the carrying capacity for a species of bird on one island may not be the same carrying capacity on a different island, right? So that can, the carrying capacity can change from environment to environment, species to species, and over the course of time, right? Think of how climate can change in one area over time. So that would change the carrying capacity. And then there's the logistic growth equation, uh, just like there was for exponential growth. And it looks pretty, uh, it looks pretty, well, actually looks a lot different for the exponential growth one. But um, the variables, again, will be defined for you on your uh, formula sheet. But they just added in the K for carry capacity. The calculations you would ever have to do with it is just, it's just simple plug and chug. It's not anything super crazy. The important thing is that you're able to identify the carrying capacity on the graph. So it's that horizontal asymptote on the graph. Okay. Uh, and then here's a sample problem they give you. So they tell you carrying capacity is 900, growth rate is 1.1, and the population um, is 425. So what is the population growth? Well, you would just plug in your, your K, in two spots, the R right there, and then the N there and there. Should be very, very simple math for you at this point in your education. I, I'm not even gonna bother writing it in for you. Uh, if you're curious, you would get 298 if you plug in all those numbers. Okay. All right, uh, I wanna talk about life history. So these are the different traits that will affect an organism's schedule of reproduction and survival. So, um, what is, uh, basically, what is going to determine, like, how often an organism reproduces or um, uh, kind of the length of their survival? And there's, there's three variables with it. One is the age of sexual maturation. So, essentially, puberty. What is the age where that organism can start having children? The second is how often does that organism reproduce? So, if you were to, you know, you rep organism can reproduce very, very often, so then they can, that population grow quickly. If the organisms of that species don't reproduce very often, then their population can't grow very quickly. And then the, the last thing is the number of offspring during each event. By event, they mean like, um, like reproductive cycle, like, you know, the getting, like how many offspring, like, is it just like humans barring twins and stuff is just one, right? But if it's like a litter of puppies, you know, there could be multiple um, offspring that can happen at once. And it's worth pointing out that like organisms don't choose, like people don't just, humans don't just choose to have one kid. Right? It's not, it's not like, it's just, it's just a result of like the evolutionary process over time. How, like these three factors, that's not something an organism can like change on their own. It can change in a population over time, over many, many, like thousands upon thousands and millions of years, but it's not something any one organism can change. Okay. There are two kinds of reproduction you need to know. Uh, the first is called semel parity. And um, semel parity, uh, I didn't make this slide, but I like big bang reproduction. Uh, basically, it's like they have all of their their uh, their offspring, boom, all at once. Oh. <laughs> uh, so many offspring are produced at once, um, and a consequence, an issue with this happening is that many of the offspring are going to die immediately after all that, that that reproduction. Why would they die afterwards? Why would like why would they not all be able to survive? Is it? Yeah, there's lack of resources, there's competition. Not all of them can survive at the same time. So then why would you choose to do that? Like, why would that be a reproductive strategy that evolution has favored? It seems like a bad idea to just have, like, offspring dying. So why, why might a species have that? And as a hint, it happens in less stable environments. So that's kind of related to the answer. You're in a really unstable environment. Why would you want to just have all of your offspring all at once? Yeah, probably. I mean, if you have them all at once, something's bound to stick. 
Yeah, so it's bound to stick. And you don't know, like, tomorrow's not guaranteed, right? YOLO. You know what I'm saying? Like, just, hey, let's have all the kids right now because we ain't promised tomorrow, you know? And, like, who knows they're going to survive. Let's just have them all. Maybe some of them will stick, and we'll keep the, uh, the species line going. So um, now, ironically, the opposite of YOLO is what we do. Interoparity, which is um, repeated reproduction. Where, you know, as humans and as lizards and other species, a lot of species do, they can have a, they can do reproduction just throughout the course of their lifetime once they've hit puberty. So um, uh, another feature of iteroparity is there's fewer offspring, like per reproductive cycle, but they're larger offspring. Okay? And this is going to happen in more stable environments. And that should make sense, right? If, if you know your environment's stable, like you have no reason to think that you're not going to just like you're not just gonna like die tomorrow, there isn't really an advantage to just having all of your offspring all at once. And in fact, that would be a disadvantage. That, that would be selected against in a stable environment. If you just have all of your offspring all at once and half of them die, you're probably gonna have fewer, you're probably gonna pass on your genes fewer times than if you just do it bit by bit over the whole course of your lifetime. If you're thinking of like Hardy Weinberg and like the n amount of alleles in a population, okay? Um, yeah, some other critical factors with this, uh, and it's really stuff we talked about, like how within like iteroparity, the survival rate of the offspring, how often they have the do reproduction, and then how many resources are available, that's going to determine, you know, kind of how successful iteroparity is, um, and all of that. Um, make sure you understand case selection versus R selection. And they, they really are, it's kind of almost like a summary of what we've been talking about with exponential and logistic growth. K selection is what you saw with carrying capacity, with that logistic growth model, where the K was your carrying capacity. And populations within a logistic growth model, uh, which is to say most species, they live around the K. They live around their carrying capacity. And that should make sense, right? Because if the carrying capacity dips, that means there's, there's resources available, so organisms will have more offspring to fill in that, that kind of power vacuum, uh, the resource availability. But if you then go over the carrying capacity, then there's not enough food to support that population. So the population will fall down, back down until you hit the carrying capacity again, and on and on it would go. Um, in case selection, there's a lot of prenatal care. Um, like you don't wanna like waste your offspring. You wanna make sure like you care for the offspring. That's gonna uh, better preserve like your genetic line. Um, again, there's low birth, birth numbers because the environment is stable. Like there's no reason for you to like do R selection, which is more exponential. That's where you really wanna uh, maximize reproductive success and try to, you don't know what's gonna happen in your environment. You wanna have all of the offspring you can as quickly as you can. Um, which means that, uh, you know, there's little to no parental care. How can you care for like all the babies you just had all at once? Like that's just too much going on there. Um, poor survival of young and exponential growth because of that competition for resources we talked about. Compared to case selection, young are gonna have a pretty good survival rate because you get high prenatal care. Um, and then uh, density dependent versus density independent. Let me, uh, let, me show, let me go over those for you. So those density dependent, density independent, they're, they're called factors that limit population growth. So density dependent, that's where it focuses on the density of the population. Where um, if you were to live in a really dense population, that is uh, more susceptible to being um, uh, preyed upon by predators. If you're a predator, you love, you love species that all congregate in one big population. That really raises your chance that you're gonna get some food. Disease, disease spreads uh, very easily when there's high population density. We, I think we're all very familiar with that after COVID, right? Um, competition, if, if a lot of people in one area and there's a, there's a carrying capacity, right? There's not infinite resources. There's gonna be a lot of competition um, and related to that is territoriality. You know, you're competing for limited territory. Uh, waste accumulation, that is also tied into disease. Um, like, uh, especially like when cities first came around and like they didn't have modern sanitation, there was so many like disease outbreaks and stuff because there would be all this waste just hanging out in the streets and like that'd be like, uh, you know, bacteria and stuff will, will feed upon that waste. All right, now density independent, as the name would suggest, is independent of the population. They're just things that just happen. Uh, the, the most common thing would just be a natural disaster. So, you know, and 
one island, like just because an island is has a lot of people on it or does not have a lot of people on it, does it make it immune to a tsunami, right? A tsunami is not like targeting islands with lots of people on it or islands with not a lot of people on it. It just happens. Same with like um, a flood or something. You know, there's not going to be any, like putting people in an area where it floods a lot doesn't necessarily make it flood more or less. Um, so again, going back to the last slide, density dependent, that's going to what you're going to see in case selection. Um, and that is because of the carrying capacity. So make sure that makes sense. The carrying capacity in case selection, that is why it's density dependent. Those are, those are kind of synonyms. Whereas density independent, because it's exponential, there's no carrying capacity. That is why it's density independent. All right, uh, wrapping things up, spe uh, focusing specifically on human populations. Um, there's two things that you'll see for zero population growth. Either you have high births and high deaths, so the high birth will cancel out by the high deaths, or you could have low birth and low death. And populations, like um, if you look at like um, developing parts of the world versus like, you know, here in America, with like a more developed part of the world, <clears throat> excuse me, populations will start at A, where it's high birth and high death rates, and they tend to move towards B, low birth and low death rate. Why is that? Like, why would you move from that from A to B? I have a couple different things. Um, <clears throat> if you're like a developing country, how do you get most of your food? You grow it, yeah. So why would it make sense for, for you to have A as a as a strategy? Maybe like I don't know if strategy is the right word, but like why does A happen more often? What's up? Yeah, yeah, high death is going to be because, like, um, uh, lack of health care, right? Lack of health care. Um, high birth, why, but why would there be high births? Exactly, yeah, the farm. And also because the lack of, like, the kids are just are dying more frequently, you, you know, like, people want to have families and stuff. Beyond just working on the farm, you want to have the high births. Now, as, as populations move from A to B, and the move from A to B, education is a major factor that drives the move from A to B. Because um, you think about it, especially like for, for women who actually have the children, if you're a woman and, you, and you're getting more education, it's, it's difficult to ha continue to have like, uh, or have the motivation to have more children if you're also getting more education, right? Um, especially like high birth, high death societies, they can have more like delineation of roles. Maybe like the women is doing more of the childcare and then like the men, the man is like doing more of like the farming work or something like that. Um, but also here in B, like think of like me and my wife, like we don't have a farm. I have no reason. Like, I'm not just like, Hey, we have a lot of kids so we can keep this farm running. You know, there's not really like, in fact, like the opposite happens. This is really important. The opposite happens in B. Kids are like, kids are expensive, you know? And so, you know, and like societies that like have, are in stage B of their population, they, um, uh, they have like, you know, maybe both the man and the woman or both have careers where it's just having kids is just more difficult and more time consuming. And then also low death because there's better, better health care, you know, the kids aren't dying as much. So you don't need to keep like trying to have more kids to replace that death rate. So anyway, there's a lot more you can get in on, on that stuff. That's kind of the basic outline you want to make sure you're aware of. Um, make sure you're able to read and understand these graphs and be able to like identify, like if they didn't show you, they didn't say this is rapid growth, be able to know this is a rapid growth uh, age structure diagram. Um, so in rapid growth, it's, it's really stable at the bottom. So the foundation where there's lots of young people, that's a sign of a rapidly growing population. Okay? That's a sign there's a lot of births. Then if you look at the United States where there's a slow growth, you know, the, the bottom is not nearly as stable, but it, there's more younger people, more births than in like Italy where there's no growth. See how, how narrow the bottom is. Now, what would be like, a, so you take like my wife and I, how many kids would we need to have to keep the population like completely steady, to have no growth? Two, right? Because there's two of us. So if we have more than two kids, 
that's where we would start contributing to population growth. If we have fewer than two kids, population would start to decline. It's it's technically should be like a little bit like 2.1 or something like that because you know the the the, the, the unfortunate scenario where like something like an infant dies like um, like uh, you know either in the womb or like just shortly after. So like maybe you need to have some couples that have three kids if you include the one that died really early, but. Um, Anyways, uh, again, the move from like rapidly growing, uh, maybe more like a developing country to more stable population growth is typically going to be education. Um, that's a big driver. Okay, um, last slide. Global carrying capacity. So as of like five days ago when I made this slide, it was 7.89 billion. Um, and then the estimated carrying capacity as of five days ago, and according to NBC, it's nine to 10 billion is our, is our estimated carrying capacity. So the world population is starting to meet that estimated, uh, hit that estimated carrying capacity. Um, not exactly sure what you do with that, but um, uh, anyways, ecological footprint, total land plus water area, um, uh, plus water area needed for uh, basically all the resources the person needs to survive uh, um, and, uh, and live. If you look at like what is sustainable in, in like uh, like on the global stage, it's about 1.7 hectares per person. In the U.S., we're at 10 <laughs> per person. So, um, oops, I guess. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't really know what you do with that, but just kind of be aware that that's a thing, I guess. And you know, beyond just like the AP exam, you know, just trying to think about what what could we do about that? What could be some solutions with it? Any questions? Okay, that, that is AP Biology. So now that you know all of AP Biology, uh, 